Hello everybody, what is up? And welcome back to the Afro is Massive podcast or the AIM podcast. In this episode, I'm interviewing the incredible Femi Olawole, who describes himself as the guy that talks about Brexit. Not only is he a political advocate, but he is also a social media genius and he is on top of his A game right now. So I'm super excited for you guys to enjoy this episode. What is up, Femi? So good to see you. Hey Jess, how you doing? <laughs> I'm really well. First of all, I just want to say that I actually can't believe that I'm talking to you, mostly because I'm a huge fan of you and I st- uh, stalk you a lot of the time <laughs> on TikTok, um, mostly when I'm like traveling around around London or if I'm on the toilet. So mm. that's a bit of it. <laughs> Thank you for the Maybe visual. TMI, but, but you know what it is? TikTok generation. This mm-hmm. is what we'd be doing. This is We're true. scrolling this is true. before sleep or, you know, after work, a lot of people are just engaging with that space and you have created such a platform for yourself over the years. This isn't just like something that's been super quick for you. You've been cultivating yeah, a really narrative awesome. for a long time and it's just it's just amazing. So what I want to do, because I, I know that I want this conversation to serve you as well and to all of those who are listening and ch- chiming in from different areas of the internet where they're finding us. So, you know, tell us a little bit about you and, you know, what is your aim right now? Okay, so that you're working on? about me, uh, so did law because I figured I could try and use, well, I figured, did law because I figured I'm good at arguing and that would be the best way to arm that skill. Figured law was hard, so I figured I'd do law with French because I'm good at French and I could basically use French to steal a law degree, which I essentially did. My French grades pulled up my law, my law grades and then figured I couldn't be a lawyer if I wanted to really save the world, so I figured I need to change the rules of the game, so politics. And then worked in human rights at the EU level because it uses my law background and my French background. Um, and then got to 2016 and I realized that Brexit was going to be a huge threat to the country and to our state of human rights, which it clearly has been. And so I came back to the UK in 2017 to try and stop it, led a national campaign. Uh, and we got the majority of people thinking that Brexit should be stopped because the majority voted for second refer- referendum parties. Um, but it wasn't enough because of our voting system. And so right now I'm just trying to A, hold the government to account in terms of the horrendous stuff they're doing on human rights and the stuff they're doing in in terms of the economy Uh, and also um, pushing to get um, the parties on the left of the Tories to support changing the voting system so that all votes count equally, which they currently don't. Okay, so obviously anyone who follows you on on TikTok knows this because you go into a lot of detail, but why did you decide to pivot and get involved in UK politics what was that moment for you when you realized I have a gift I have a voice and I want to use it and I'm going to use it so I want you to put yourself in my shoes you okay. <laughs> um you've uh you've studied law and you, you specialize kind of in EU law so you've studied um you've worked in you've uh, went to university in France for one year for Erasmus so you studied the EU law modules there and, and you got the French perspective on EU law as well when you finish university, you then, after a couple of different um, small roles, you then end up in Brussels. You work alongside the um, elected members of the European Parliament. So you're working alongside British members of the European Parliament every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're seeing the, that the, and you're working for an NGO that basically fights against the human rights abuses in the Gulf states. So Saudi Arabia, Bahrain. And you're seeing how. Um, the UK is selling the weapons to Saudi Arabia that they're using to bomb hospitals and schools in Yemen. You're seeing how the police in Bahrain are traveling to Santos, um, to the military academy in the UK. Uh, I forget what the name is. Um, But they're being trained in the UK to then go Mm -hmm. back to Bahrain and torture human rights defenders in in Bahrain. And you feel ashamed. Because this is your, you're fighting for human rights at the international level, and your country, you're working with 27 other countries. Yeah. Your country is one of the ones that are being the worst in terms of damaging our human rights on the international level. And so you're already seeing what you see as a battle between you've got David Cameron and the Tories on one side, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. being the bad guys, and you've got the EU on the on the other side trying to help us be good guys. And then you hear about Brexit, that things might get even worse. Mm-hmm. And even though you haven't paid that much attention to UK politics before, you realize, oh no, this could send things in a really bad direction. Um, and then you look at the conversation around Brexit, and you've got David Cameron and Jeremy Corbyn, both on the side of Remain, not really talking to each other 
and not really getting the job done either in terms of explaining stuff that people need to know, which you know because you've studied EU law. So when you hear stuff like um, how the EU is a dictatorship, hang on, you've been working next to the EU elected members of the European Parliament. You know, you, it's literally your day, your day, day, to day, day to day life that is, it's not a dictatorship, it's a democracy. And these are the guys standing up for our human rights. And so you realize, okay, I've got to start trying to use the abilities that I've got because you work in advocacy. Mm-hmm, you can mm-hmm. probably, you know how social media works. Try and put some stuff out there. So, so I started, um, I made my first video in like March, 2016, just explaining, hey, 2016. yeah, 2016. Um, and I was, I managed to sneak into the European Parliament to film it there so I could get some like gravitas behind me. Um, and uh, I filmed the video and basically said, um, the, U- the EU is there particularly to protect our human rights. And it's not a surprise that the one that wants to get rid of it is the same one that wants to privatize our, he- our health care, the ones to- that sell weapons to Saudi Arabia so they can bomb hospitals and schools. And also, I, under- I basically disproved the whole narrative around how the EU con- uh, allows completely uncontrolled migration. So I hit the three main points that I thought were the three main points. Um, and then I kept making videos after that. But between uh, January 2016 and June 2016, I went from maybe... 15 followers on Twitter to 25 followers on Twitter. I wasn't Yeah, 2016, exactly... this is, that's early. You know, if we think about how much social media and Web2 has kind of expanded since that point, I think maybe in the last like three years, we've seen a lot of growth mm. uh, and momentum online. But like starting from 2016, that's really early days to be used, like doing face to camera video, putting content out there regularly. You know, yeah. we had our Instagrammers and stuff, but it was still photos. It was still kind of cute. Like, this is really progressive stuff that you were doing. So, certainly within the UK context, um, because my, I think my idol is um, a guy called Philip DeFranco. Have you heard of him? Okay. Have heard Uh, of him, yeah. He's um, he's, he's an an American YouTuber who basically, he does the news on a regular basis. And I've been a fan of him since, oh, 2006. Okay. Um, so like, he's the guy that taught me how to, um, well, not obviously taught me, but I learned yeah, from why, him how why, to... why? What was that moment where you looked at him and you were like, I resonate with this guy. What can I absorb from him? It's because he's, he was obviously clear, clearly good at making, making an argument, clearly good at making yeah. a point, And he was reaching people and he was doing it in a way that was really, really useful. So I got, uh, I'd say between 2006 and 2010, I got all of my news from him which isn't a good way to operate, but I, yeah, he was <laughs> awesome. And and I, and I really valued the content he was putting out there because he broke down stuff that's really complicated because as somebody who wasn't really interested in politics, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, I, as, I, as I said before, I grew up in, I was born in Darlington, grew up in Swansea, Dundee, Birmingham, those places. So the politics for me was just old men shouting at each other in London hundreds of miles away. It yeah. didn't really feel... Like I was connected to it. And so having somebody break it down in a way that, oh, okay, I, don't understand. I can understand how that might affect my life, that sort of thing, that was really useful. Um, and so, and realizing that that wasn't, that was really tailored to an American audience, not our audience, I realized there was a gap in the market for somebody to help explain what's happening in, in Westminster um, to people in, in the UK. And so when I saw that the conversation happening on the mainstream media in the UK, yeah. Um, was just so poor I realized all right well nobody's really doing face to camera stuff explaining um, Mm -hmm. how Brexit's going to affect them Um, so I better get on that Um, and I was good at Facebook and I always told myself I'd never get onto Twitter because Facebook had already taken over my life and if I ever went onto Twitter it would take over my life completely I was right Um, I have no life (laughs) but yeah it's uh, it was necessary Mm. And I find that Twitter is still doing bits, you know, even though we've got all of these other social media platforms that we're able to engage with. And your social media presence is incredible because you've got everything pretty much in every space. But Twitter is still such a key space for Internet users to actually have a voice and have freedom of speech. I guess we have a lot of censoring and things that are going on on the other platforms. Mm. Um, So, you know, how much of of your day, for example, do you engage with Twitter? Are you looking for for the discourse? Are you responding? That sort of thing. Like how what's your energy input? So I'd I'd say that Twitter is where I spend the majority of my day. Um, Really? Yeah. And it's. It's because, and, and the thing is, when I, as you say, I'm on, I'm, I'm on a bunch of different platforms. Whenever I spot creators that I feel um, 
uh, should be heard on a larger on a larger platform should get their message out there mm-hmm. um, because I, I empathize with that as I said yeah. in 2016 yeah. I was putting all, I was saying all the right things but to 25 followers yes. um, and so I, I very much empathize with the notion of you're putting out good content but nobody's seeing it and the right people aren't seeing it and the thing about Twitter is it's where all the politicians are it's where all mm-hmm. the journalists are so if you want to really make a difference yes you need to um, uh, reach young people reach the young people get them engaged on those on Instagram on TikTok etc but if you want to really get the old people who are in the seats of power listening to you then Twitter is a space to be so I always say all right uh, hey creator on TikTok either join Twitter or tell me where you're tell me what your handle is so I can then promote your stuff on 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 Twitter um and That's yeah amazing. It, it is necessary what, what, that's an amazing use of your kind of um, digital power, should I say, with your influence. Um, what's been something, what's been a person that you've seen on TikTok, you know, where you've just given this example? Is there any that spring to mind or, you know, that you remember that you really liked their stuff and you were like, yeah, let's get you out there? Um, so Kane Kawasaki, so K-A-Y-N-E um, Kawasaki. He's a, he's a, he's a former history, t- history teacher um, on, on everything to do with, Black history, he is my go-to, absolute nice. go-to. So not everybody who's black knows everything about, about black history, not everybody who's black knows everything about all the issues facing black people in the UK. Mm-hmm. He is my person, all right, you, you actually have the lived experience that I, that I, that I need, that people need to see, um, and so things like that. Um, there's a woman called Emma is a feminist. Um, she is absolutely spot on, that's her nice. handle, um, when it comes to feminist issues, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and, she's kind of okay <laughs> yeah. um uh and yeah so her stuff is amazing as well so try and get that on, on tiktok as, as much as possible um that that sort of stuff so people who nice. have experiences of things that i haven't got um because i often say that my platform doesn't belong to me i grew my platform because greg i happened to study the topic that happened to be at the center of the biggest thing that was crumbling british society at the time yeah i studied yeah. eu law eu law became the focus of the conversation and that and be, it was people that believe in a better more progressive uk that decided to follow me that following came by chance with with me so the people who um are outside of don't have that kind of luck my platform belongs to them just as much as it belongs to me mm. that's amazing being able to give those give space for those voices and you know providing other narratives and other ways of viewing different uh, things that are going on in our country or across countries on an international level you know yeah um and I, I think that's what definitely something that resonated with me because hearing you speak about certain areas and sit different things that helped to kind of educate me on how I could also speak about things as well. Because sometimes, you know, it's we we are very good at framing opinions, but sometimes aren't good at verbalizing that. Mm. So I probably could assume that you are in a lot of people's saved folders across <laughs> <laughs> across social media platforms. How does that make you feel? You know that you are a point of inspiration for a lot of people across demographics, across age ranges. Um, so it's it's obvious it's obviously um it's a responsibility of obviously um, but it, I also know that I tend not to focus on um me being the center of attention or people and people say for or anything. It's more just I look at all right. Here's how screwed the currently the country currently is. Mm-hmm. And um, very, very few people are able to change the conversation in any sort in any sort of way. So I just have a job, which is to make sure that I platform as many of those views that aren't being heard in the mainstream media as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's it's more just this is what I have to do rather than this is something that's making me feel all special sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think the amount of things that you've done, you know, it's also very visual, like we're looking at a lot of TV stuff and being mm. put into the spotlight or under pressure to respond, especially within the presence of antagonizers. Mm. I don't know if you saw, actually, I saw one of your posts yesterday or the day before, and it was talking about Brexit. I don't know if you saw my comment, because I was like, you better send this link to her. It was when it's basically like a big, I told you so saying, yeah, we, yeah, I yeah, said yeah, this yeah, about yeah, Brexit, yeah, 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 like, yeah fucking years ago and now look where we are we can't even afford fish so (laughs) you know um how do you deal with antagonizers in that way when you can clearly see that people are trying to get you riled up trying and you are so cool calm and collected you're the coolest cucumber (laughs) literally and that's also again why it's very 
inspiring to listen to you and watch because it's almost like nothing can phase you you know so there are a couple of elements to that there's um is it strategically okay to ever lose your cool and on that one race very much comes into it because mm. the moment I ever am seen to lose my cool all it takes is five seconds of a Femi loses his cool and goes eight yeah Yep. that's I'm done um because yep. that footage will be will be lose will be used constantly throughout my career and it will just confirm that angry black man stereotype it's yep. just yep. not an option so I always I, I it's just removed from my head as an option to go to um ever um uh as for the trolling and and the abuse that I get when I'm on on mm. those platforms because they'll be so much more abusive to me than I could ever dream of being to yeah. them yeah yeah um and a, I remember I can't if I, if I, at the moment I lose my call, they win and they want me to yeah. lose my call. And that's yeah. one of the things. One of the things that's quite cool is with like people like Nigel Farage. Um, when I've gone up against him, he'll be trying to make me lose my call, and the fact that I don't makes him lose him his call. loses call. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I love that. And that, honestly, as far as if you want an anger release, get them to lose their call instead. Yeah, it's almost like being stabbed with your own knife. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, as for how it affects me personally, um. I'm not sure you, you may have seen I did a I did a mental health post recently. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not in a great place. I, I, okay. I, I, will, I will say that. Um, but yeah. the thing is, the irony is, it's not the abuse. It's the fact that um, because I, I've had to turn myself into somebody who is completely numb to that abuse. So yeah. it doesn't affect me anymore. But yeah. that also has other consequences for in terms of me being able to connect with people in general. Because if I shut the walls down completely, then it's kind of a problem. Absolutely. Um, so there is that, but there is there is a halfway house. For for me, it's it's gone that far because I've ha I had to basically during those two years from two thousand two thousand start two thousand eighteen to end two thousand nineteen, I mm -hmm. had no life at all. I was just on the road constantly. Okay. Um. So there was nothing in my life other than just trying to stop Brexit. Yeah. Um. So I'm in a I'm in a unique case, and with and with the the abuse that I got in that period was abuse every minute, uh, racial abuse every few days. Threats of violence every month or so. Uh, oh threats gosh. of murder every three months. And in 2018, somebody posted my home address online. Fortunately, oh I just moved out. Oh my god! So I'm a particularly special case in terms of that whole abuse thing. But in yeah. general, I guess what I'd say is because there are a lot of people that, we, that listen to this and thinking, "Oh, well, oh if, if it's that terrible, uh, how, how can I get yeah, involved?" Yeah, then I should never speak out about anything online because someone's going to come to my house. <laughs> someone's going to come to my yard. <laughs> I, it, it, like I said, it, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, it, I get a lot more than your average person. If you if you speak yeah. out, it won't get that bad. However, what I will say is they will try and bring you down by attacking you in every way they can think of. Yeah. And I'm going to, as you know, I'm a bit of a nerd. I'm going to steal a quote from Stargate, uh, which is... Go on. <laughs> um, when it comes to resisting the influence of others, knowledge of oneself is most important. Okay. And that is, if you know who you are, what you stand for, why you're doing the things you're doing, why yeah. you're saying the things you're saying, and you know your stuff, then nothing anybody says ever matters. Because if they try and tell you, you're only doing this for clout, you're only doing this for the money, if you, if you know that your priority is helping people, that means nothing. They're yeah. just saying stuff that you know is wrong. And you can show them that they're wrong because of everything you've done. And so just know, know who and what you are, know your mm -hmm. stuff. And that stuff will just go what off a duck's back. Knowing your purpose, right? Mm, exactly. And being able to lead with that, you know, because not ev we're not confident every day, mm. but it's just continuing with understanding who you are. I think that's that's really impactful. Just thinking about because, like, um, I do Afro hair advocacy, and within the film and TV industry mostly, and it can feel like really big. And I'll myself have like periods of a few months or a few weeks where I'm like yes no we have to continue speaking out and protecting ourselves as black performers on set because like the abuse on set is just ridiculous and then some days I'm like oh maybe I shouldn't say anything because you know could risk getting film work in the future and that sort of thing so because you know there's also a lot of um kind of backlash that you get on speaking out and especially because it's quite um I don't know when you're in hair and makeup it's mm. it's a very different kind of energy where I don't necessarily you're going to get trolled and things like that it's a lot less aggressive than that but I think because it is so it is a lot less overt mm. it's more insidious if that kind of makes sense uh, no, no I, I get that can you give uh, get, tell me more about that so okay 
I was just bearing in mind, I had a conversation with somebody else <clears throat> who's in the film industry yesterday about it. Mm. But, you know, as an example, on every film job that I've been on, no stylists really have been able to work on my hair, know what they're doing. On every job, I expect that somebody who is assigned to me to do my hair isn't trained, doesn't have an understanding of black hair or black texture, black hair texture mm -hmm. um, and its requirements. And therefore, they're unqualified to work on my hair. Um, so I go in and the majority of black performers will go in with their own hair products, expecting to experience that in the workplace where they're mm. not being considered um you know and it's it's a lot as well as a lot of other stuff that goes on on set there's also a lot of like um intolerance and things like that that goes on but in terms of afro is massive and what i'm working on right now it really is focusing on kind of denormalizing the fact that hairstylists aren't educated on black hair within institution you know, because uh, they'll I, always say like, oh, I'm a trained hairstylist. And I'm like, OK, great. You've got a qualification from a mm. from a body that's gatekeeping the knowledge, but you don't know how to do hair. That's a whole sector of your field that you don't know about. Yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah. What you're saying resonated a bit with me, despite me not being in that industry on the basis of I remember when I first went to um, uh, get my hair cut in a in a um, in a barber in, in in my in my town and the yeah. stylist did not how, know how to cut a black hair and so we had to basically go back and the black barber then did it um and it was entirely fine i know that when i went on a tv show which i will not name um and they um uh basically the makeup made me look like a ghost it was uh, really bad <laughs> uh, she <and>, yeah <laughs> as hell um it was uh, like i watch it back and cringe like i did not know i looked that bad um, so I think I need to grab that footage, you know, that's, <laughs> that's floating around somewhere on the web. <laughs> but since then, I'm just like anti shine and stop. That's it. Just give yeah. me the anti shine and no more. Um, mm. That hairdresser one. I remember the first time um, my mum took me to a hairdresser in our local area to mm. get a haircut. And I was really excited. And I remember the woman looked at me and was like, we don't cut that hair here. And it's just like, what do you do with that information as yeah. a child, you know? And then especially living here in the UK we get told so much about our hair and who we are by non-black people mm. and that really does form formulate who we become later on you know yeah um but you know um, makeup as well makeup is such a it's such an issue I just don't understand it <laughs> yeah uh, and, it, it, and it and the thing is uh, when it comes when it comes to skin we're seeing that sort of stuff happening in in, in the med in medicine as well because it's getting becoming more and more of, of a talked about issue that because uh, doctors and medics and, and nurses are, are trained on white examples when they're in, in medical school, um, they don't know what certain conditions look like on black skin. And mm -hmm. that's how black people end up getting, um, well, they mi end up missing diagnosis or they end up getting misdiagnosed and that sort of thing that really affects people's lives. Um, and that's fortunately is being talked about a bit more these days, but it's the same sort, it's the same topic of conversation, be it the makeup industry, be it, be it, be it medicine, it just affects people's ability to do their job and go about their lives. It just seems to be like ubiquitous across every industry. I'm not understanding. Mm. You know, it's 2022. Mm. Every yeah. single industry, there is, there are stories, there are horror yeah. stories. Um, There's, it's just uh, rife at the um, minute. I uh, mean, it, it, it does, it does need these conversations. And unfortunately, um, when you try and have these conversations, they will just um, the, the 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 media narrative just finds a way to shift it towards something else. They will pick mm -hmm. the most mm -hmm. extreme or the most innocuous example and try and say that that's our narrative. Um, and like uh, after the Black Lives Matter protests in two thousand and twenty, yeah, um, I went on a show with Eamon Holmes and Nigel Farage, right, uh, on this morning and. Uh, I got asked. I got asked on, and they were like, uh, "So, Rule Britannia, BBC wants to get rid of Rule Britannia um, because of the slaves line. Uh, what do you think about this?" And I said, "Well, no, this is just a distraction from the, from the genuine acts that Black Lives Matter have. For example, yeah. blind CVs to avoid workplace discrimination. Yes, yes. Um, it, it, it better it making a, a less um, white Anglo centric curriculum so that people aren't seen as some people aren't seen as better historically. Mm -hmm. Blah blah. White and heroism. Exactly." Um, and it's just a distraction. Okay, cool. Come on. And then when I got on there, Eamon Holmes just like was just uh, Eamon Holmes said, "What do you what do you think about this?" I said, "Well, 
first of all, the song is obviously racist because it's basically celebrating how we've never been slaves even though we were enslaving other people. But really yeah. this issue is, is just being used to, to distract from the genuineness of Black Lives Matter yeah. and, and what we need to achieve, achieve um, racial justice. And, 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 and as I try to go on, on to things about, oh, if we, if we could look at the fact that uh, if you send a CV, um, Oxford University research shows that if you send, um, they sent out 3,200 CVs, uh, if you've got a black sounding name, you have to send 80% more job applications to get a callback, that God. sort of thing. Um, so if we introduce blind CVs where you don't have the name visible, then yep. that would significantly address discrimination and allow people to access work, et cetera. And he just cut me off. And he said, well, no, we're here to talk about about um, rural, rural Britannia. Well, no, my point is that that's a distraction. That's, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you're inviting me on to that's talk about- That's not the ask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're inviting me on to talk about um, how people who um, who align with Black Lives Matter feel about Royal Britannia. This is how we feel about it. It's mm-hmm. not, it, and there's a there's a confusion between um, being changing the topic and changing the angle. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we're, just because we don't want to stick to your narrative doesn't mean we're yeah. off topic. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how they try and um, misrepresent. Almost going, it, go, yeah. they're going adjacent. Yeah, exactly. You know. Focus exactly. on the target here, people. Yeah. And I can imagine, actually, when you're, for example, in a live TV setting where you're on air mm. and you come, you know, you're prepped, you're ready, you know what, what you're about and you know what you're going to say. And yep. then they're giving you these curveballs constantly, which is just keeping you off topic. Oh, yeah. Like uh, in that particular one. It feels like then... being in the ring. Oh, it, it really is. It really is. Because I had Nigel Farage call me an extremist twice in that, on that particular episode. Mm. Uh, and then uh, Eamon Holmes, the host, then went off on one saying, well, how about the other, these other anthems where they mention slaves? Because you seem to have a problem anytime anybody's mentioned slaves. Why do you have a problem anytime anybody mentions slaves? In the- That's weird. What a weird thing to say. 84 Ofcom complaints. 84 Ofcom complaints. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> And to call you an extremist as well, that's pretty disgusting. Being called an extremist by Nigel Farage. Mm. That's that's the thing. (laughs) Unbelievable. And this is the thing, you know, TV is a whole other ballgame. There's, you know, there's so much you can do online, social media. Like, I'm assuming, Mm. do you make all your content? Yeah. um, uh, I haven't. Yeah, I think think, think 95% of my content is is just me. Phone camera, which is right there. um, Nice. And then... And then I'll, I'll edit it on my laptop. Um, yeah, that's it's just, and then put it up. That's the thing. When you're in a live context, like there's very little control that you have mm-hmm. in that moment. Obviously, like we said, it's controlling yourself and how you come across and just just the the points that you want to express, I guess. Um, but, you know, having said that, okay, we can't be on a podcast today and mm. not talk about what happened last week. Okay, mm-hmm. and I know the whole internet has been talking about it, so let's just keep it short and sweet. <laughs> okay, yeah, Will. Yep. Talk to me about Will. <sighs> that. Was what was your first? Okay, I'm gonna cut you over there. What was your first reaction when you first saw it? Because I know we've I... all watched it a million times. So what was your okay. first one? So I had to do first. I did first and second. My first initial reaction was, "Oh God, Will." This is not good for the culture. This is this is uh, our the entire culture. thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, you're making us look bad. There's like been fifth, like maybe what is it, fifteen black uh, Oscar not Oscar wins in in history, and on one of those, you're gonna have that be the story. Come you're gonna on, break up someone. <laughs> And, and and then the second thought was, oh my God, at one point in my life, both of you were my favorite people on planet mm, Earth. Mm-hmm. Like, never scared, um, bigger and blacker. Uh, Chris Rock was my idol. Right. Um, um, Big Willie style, men in black, Wild Wild West. Yes, uh-huh, I loved uh-huh. Wild Wild West. I was like, but, okay. <laughs> um, these guys are my were gods to me at some point in my life. And to see them both at each other... Mm. And in a way that was really embarrassing. Uh, so yeah. And then afterwards, I then read into what the what the history behind the topics were. I was like, "Oh, great! So you're, neither of you are, are, are coming off clean in this one." Yeah. Um, because obviously, uh, um, actually, let me ask you that question: Why was what Chris Rock said problematic? I don't know the film that she was in. Mm. Was it GI Jane? G. 
G.I. Jane. Um, okay. Yeah, the film with, I think it's Demi Moore where she shaved her head um, to yeah. become a fighter pilot, I think. I did not see that film, so I have no context around that film. But, mm. you know, being a black woman and black hair is every, well, it's not everything to us, but it gets put mm. on to you as that is your everything. You know, and the, it's always been said that black hair is political. So by being our natural selves, by, therefore we are being disruptive. We are not... Um, adhering to normative standards which we know are Eurocentric beauty standards mm. um, and we're con consistently problematized but also black women always are the end up being the butt of the joke you know um, so it's it's hard because the engagement that they had I don't know what the history is between Chris Rock and Jada either however mm. I just couldn't believe when I first saw it I was just like oh, we've been working so hard we've been working so hard and then I, also my second reaction I was like you just released a book Will mm. you just released your book <laughs> where we spoke about this you know yeah. so I don't know it's it's kind of hard that in terms of coming out from a black hair perspective and being made the butt of a joke especially when it's a health condition alopecia you know it created a whole alopecia awareness movement because obviously it's it's um a health issue where you know people commit suicide because of it you know when tell me, tell me about alopecia itself so alopecia is when there are different forms of alopecia um the person who i follow within the afro hair care community is gina knight she is absolutely incredible and she speaks out a lot about this stuff because she has alopecia and she makes uh real hair wigs for women and they're like afro hair wigs 4c wigs they're absolutely stunning um but it's when the hair follicles die so, you know, obviously when you're a woman and hair is supposed to be the the epitome of female, feminine, divine beauty and that mm. sort of thing, um, to have that falling out is traumatic and it's really damaging for your feeling of self-worth and all this sort of stuff. So many people go through it, including men as well. But I suppose it's just more damaging yeah. for women because especially then when you uh, have to shave all your hair off. A lot of them at half the time are being asked, oh, have you had cancer? Like, are you going through treatment? And it's like, you know, let's normalize all different types of hair, especially, you know, yeah. even when they're not there. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the backstory on alopecia in itself. And I think, you know, that's why Will's reaction was so strong because his wife was dealing with a, a health care issue. Um, so then again, just very, just very bad taste jokes. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, you and it, it wasn't particular. wasn't a particularly clever one either, or funny. Um, it wasn't funny. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. funny. Where well, there were no laughs in mm. that moment. Mm. It, it's it's so yeah. So for, so for me, it was just a case of all right. You've told a really bad joke, and then you've come up. I mean, there are way there are a thousand different ways Will could have handled that, where everybody mm. would have been on it on his side and on Jada's side. Um, he could have basically, he could have, he could, have, if he wanted to go up, he could have gone up and say, "I'm, I'm going to need you to apologize," and just. Stood That's there. what I thought. I was like, if he maybe even if Will had like grabbed the mic and just done a formal thing, saying, "Look, that's not funny. We don't mm. appreciate that. This X, Y, and Z," and left it at that. Yeah. But first of all, because you know there were so many um, screenshots of people sending around and like. Chris had like a patch on his face prior. So we didn't know if it was like a, a marketing thing. There's this whole thing with Pfizer that came out regarding mm. alopecia. Cause they just brought out alopecia hair treatment as well. Something along those lines. Mm. So it's all a bit muddy, muddy waters, mm. but all in all, I heard on the radio today that Will is now banned from ever receiving an Oscar from the body. Interesting. Uh, well, that was well, on the news today. Well, on oh. Capital Extra. So, <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't know. So, so last I heard was was a few days ago when he um, resigned from. Well, not resigned. He he left the um, the guild that basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the Oscars Guild. Um, but I didn't know he had been having banned for life. That's what they said mm. on Capital Extra this morning. However okay. much that is to go by, I don't know. But he was pretty mm. shocked when he read that out. Okay. Um, Can you imagine? So bearing in mind that only 15, what was it, 15 black Oscar yeah. winners? Yeah, and now um, Will maybe can't receive another one again. Uh, let me just do that quick search. Oscar. Do the Googles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how many black people won Oscars? The answer is 20. Is it 20? Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. We got the maths right. Well, yeah. sort of. <laughs> We've got sort it right of. now. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it, it, it is a shame because as I said, these guys were gods to me. Yeah. Um, um, Chris Rock, 
his comedy is what I hold up as like the example of how to joke about sensitive topics and do mm-hmm. it well. Um, Tastefully. Yeah, uh, like because he talks about the um, serious issues of racism and makes it funny. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 uh, Will Smith, he what he did with um, with Fresh Prince back then, and what now what recent I'm now watching Bel Air. I've just caught up last night. Um, Have you seen it? Yes, I've just I've just, I've just oh, I've just, I'm, I'm finally up to date. It's and it's it's really really good, and it's so it's it's so important because it deals with those issues of class and race and mm-hmm. and how they come together because obviously mm-hmm. will's original background is from a different a different class of the family he then joins and but yeah. they still have to deal with racial issues as well um and 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 that family that he then joins is of a higher class than some of the white people around him and that is it, just a beautiful way to discuss those issues mm-hmm. and to see both of them involved in something that pulls everybody down a little bit it's it was painful to see could have could have done it after the show could have done that after the show. Could have done it in a better way. Catch me outside. Down. Yeah. <laughs> How about it? <laughs> yeah. If he'd done a full Natalie Breglione or whatever her name is impression from the sixties, that position. would have been a great way to deal with that. <laughs> that would be And then hilarious. actually catch hands outside. You know, fine. <laughs> yeah. Whatever happens off camera, <laughs> exactly. we don't mind. <laughs> oh God, it's a lot. It's a lot. But this is the thing. I think. There's always something going on. It's always like we've got this constant battle. If it's not Will and Chris, it's someone else. We're constantly having these like right hooks that are coming at our community. But mm. I feel like because, well, mind you, that's just always that's just always been our history, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're always having to fight something in order to validate our sense of being, our sense of existing. You so, know. Yeah, and and for me, it's. It's about keeping a laser focus on the things that need to happen to get us out of this, to, mm-hmm. to make things, to make things step forward. And for me, how do you solve racism, g- gain equality? Um, it, as 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 te- as uh, cold and and what do you call it? Uh, academic as this sounds, the voting system is is the way you do that because mm-hmm. as it currently stands. The majority, the majority of votes in the UK have gone to parties to the left of the Conservatives in all but three elections since the Second World War. And yet the Tories have been in power for 46 of the last 76 years. Yeah. Which yeah. means that we consistently get governments that are more right-wing than the people who actually vote them in. And so, and if you look at things like, um, for example, and because of that system where you have, if 30% vote Green, 30% vote Labour, and 40% vote Tory... In, mm-hmm. a, in a given area, the Tory will win, even though 60% voted for left-wing parties. Repeat, that's how this system is broken. And so based on the maths of the last election, where the Tories got 44% of the vote and 56% of the seats, yeah. if you have to do the maths, that means that Tory votes were worth 30% more than Labour votes and 18 times more than Green votes. Right. So it's... If you want to actually stop being consistently um, run by Tories, who um, most recent, uh, you know, the the race report that came out recently, where they basically said that we don't have a problem with institutional racism. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Exactly. The United you can't make Nations. This stuff up. Yeah, I know. I know. The United Nations said that they um, they said that the Conservative Party was effectively quote trying to, seeking to normalize white supremacy mm-hmm. because if you because um, the stuff like. I mean, they, they use the same stat that I referred to before about how you have to send more job applications uh, if you're a black person to get a call back when you're applying. And they said that, well, that might not be because of race. It might be because of the perceived class of the person applying. I, uh, employers assume that black people are lower class. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's racism. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, hun. <laughs> Uh, and and that's why it's, it's normalizing white supremacy. So if mm. you, if, until we deal with the voting system, people like that are going to be in power. And the things that we need to change things, so for example, um, either giving tax incentives or making it mandatory to use blind CVs where people don't see the names or yeah. where the person comes from, or the gender or sex, you can deal with all kinds of inequality. Yes. Yes. We won't get the progress that we actually need. Yeah. <sighs> it's a lot. It's a lot. I just, because I, I remember seeing that actually. And it just, what's, what's the kind of phrase, kind of, um, he really fell into a trap hmm. there where he revealed actually hmm. how, I don't want to use the word bigoted, but do you, do you know what I mean? Like, 
I, I will. <laughs> I, I, I can do it. <laughs> you do it. You do it. <laughs> have you have you seen that? Have you seen that video? I can't remember. It's on the. It's, was it like CNBC or something like that? And it's and the one of the, the white presenter was like, I can't say the N word, and the other guy was like, Say it. I'll say it with you. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to say it, I'll say it with you. <laughs> Honestly, the entitlement, the entitlement. It's too much. Yeah, I watched that. Mm, it's one, one of the greats. In in a journey where you've been working diligently, you know, hmm. online, in real life, advocating, this has been something that you've committed so much of your time to and it can often feel like a journey that's never going to end. It's, it's ongoing, right? Hmm. Um what are your kind of hopes for how things will change? And do you think they can change? Like in an ideal world, what would you like to happen in the next three to five years? And that's a big so, question. It, no, it, it's, it's cool. And, and that's, uh, and as you said, there is that thing of feeling like this is never going to end. And I remember when the Brexit deal was finally negotiated mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. 2020, I broke down in tears because... Yeah. Not that I wanted a no deal, which would have completely destroyed the economy. We'd have seen immediate, absolute chaos. But because I knew that because we got one of those deals that would be not as good as staying in the EU, but still significantly really, really bad. Yes. Um, it would be a slow bleed over the next 10, 20 years. And I, so I realized that we'd be like, if you throw a frog, there's an there's a analogy whereby if you throw a frog into boiling water, it'll jump out immediately. Yeah. But if you throw a frog into warm water and gradually turn up the heat, it won't notice the difference and it'll slowly boil to death. Yeah. And that's what I saw happening with the UK. And so that notion of it just going on and on and on, uh, that's what brought me to tears. And I, I, I sort of found my hope again when I realized, all right, there is a way out of this. As I said, the majority votes for parties to the left of the Conservative Party and has done consistently since World War II. So we do have the votes there to turn this around. Um, how do you make use of that, though? The only way you make use of that is if the parties on the left choose to work together so we stop wasting progressive votes. Mm -hmm. And how do we get them to do that? Because they tend to hate each other. All right, well, if Labour commits to delivering a, a fair voting system, an equal voting system within 12 months of taking office, then that means parties like the Lib Dems, the Greens, can know that if they vote for Labour, then it'll make all future votes for the, Labour, for the Lib Dems and Greens actually count in all future elections. So it's actually in their interest to work together. And also, from Labour's perspective, if... Um, if the part, if the uh, if the other opposition parties get a fair share of the vote, they'll effectively be taking seats from the Conservatives, and the seats will basically go from from the Conservatives to parties that Labour can actually work with. So it's in everybody's interest to work together. And so if that happens, if they do work together at, at the next election or maybe the election after that, then you will get the Tories out. And then once they're in, once the uh, opposition parties are in, um, you can then change the voting system so that all votes count equally. And the mm -hmm. Tories will be effectively locked out of power for yeah. good. Yeah. And that can happen within the next five, ten years. And that is what gives me hope. Mm. So, okay, knowing that that's a possibility, mm. what are you currently working on right now? What's the next kind of big project, I suppose, that you're working towards or the big, the next big step? So I'm working with um, Make Votes Matter, which is the largest uh, electoral reform uh, organization in, in the UK. Okay. Um, Labour for PR is the organization within Labour that is also pushing in that direction. Um, and as for what's in the immediate, me immediate term, it's things like the policing bill, which just yeah. got voted through at third reading, which is a, se a serious problem. And I think people need to be aware of what has happened to their rights Mm -hmm. under that under that bill because it basically says that can you give us a taste uh yeah so if you're noisy enough at a protest but somebody nearby at risk of feeling quote unquote serious unease then you can be fined up to two thousand five hundred pounds no. now the concept of serious unease um a that's completely subjective because Vague. yeah yeah it's, it's it's not like a decibel limit it's just serious unease and it undermines the whole point of a protest. Yeah. Because if you've got a politician in parliament who's passing laws that are going to ruin people's lives, which this government consistently mm -hmm, does, mm -hmm. and you've got people outside shouting loudly enough that they feel, feel seriously uneasy about what they're doing, then that politician under this law can then basically release the hounds on those prot protesters. Yeah. That's the exact opposite of what of of the spirit of what protest is, about, is supposed to be about. So, yeah. Yeah. We've lost I, I our right to protest, yeah. 
yeah, we, we fundamentally are. And so uh, the, the slogan I've been using throughout is speak now or forever fear police because things oh. will only get worse. Whoa, <laughs> that is, yeah, that is a great line. Uh, and, and, and especially given the people who tend to fear police more than, more than most, given, given um, the, the stats that, that we see, we climate, know who this yeah. power, this, these powers are going to be used against. We know that the, um, the, um, well, this is one of the greatest things. So the um, the government's own website shows that black people are stopped and searched by police between nine and ten times more than white people. Um, so we have that information yeah. in the official in the official government stats, and yet the government's equality minister said that it's illegal to teach the kids that white white the white supremacy sorry the that white white privilege is a is a fact. So you've got the government stats saying we know that we disproportionately mistreat yes. black people. Le- uh, yes. more than white people but it's illegal to teach kids that it's illegal that to the teach them that yeah yes. it's illegal <laughs> to show them the stats to show them the numbers exactly so uh, and yeah then that's the that's the gaslighting like we know yeah. we know the problem yes <laughs> yes gaslighting just it just feels very very heavy you know yeah. and i think you can i think especially young people you know can feel quite small when it comes to knowing what to do and, you know, if they do have a voice, feeling the confidence to keep speaking up in the same way that you did, you know, when mm. you first started, you just put yourself out there and just continued and continued. So I don't know, what advice would you give to somebody who is, you know, who feels like they have a voice and that they want to share and that they want to uh, be able to speak out on what they on what they believe and what they stand for? What advice can you give to that person? As for feeling small, especially if I'm speaking to people in, in Gen Z, um, I I would say that one thing I would uh, I would I'm essentially counting on you, like um, because our my generation, so millennial generation, I'm 32 right now, just turned, and our generation we were essentially silenced by the other by the upper generation because they're the ones who've had power our whole lives. Yeah. Gen Z doesn't have that problem. Their seniors are us. Yeah. We're the ones who we are desperately waiting for you guys to take over. Um, I, I see you very much as the guys that are going to revolutionize, revolutionize this country. So just keep going because that's what the future is going to be. And if you take an issue like uh, like Brexit, we knew from, I think, the, I think the stat came out in, I think, 2017 that by, was it by 2021? Uh, the stat would reverse simply because I know this is dark, mm-hmm. but so because old people, the what is it? Um, under uh, under twenty under twenty five voted seventy three percent remain, um, etc. Old people voted Brexit, young people voted for yeah. Remain. Simple. So by by twenty twenty one, the stat reverses just because young people join the register, old people move off the register. Yeah. yeah, that's just how it works. You guys are the future. So honestly, just the sooner you guys accept that you are the future and speak as the future and put your voice out there, the faster this change happens because it needs to happen. Um, so A, I'm counting on you. So you guys actually in, excite me in terms of how things can be in the future. Um, also, I'd say pick two platforms. I'm, I'm on, what am I on? I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, um, TikTok. Um, so I'm on five, but this is my full-time job. <laughs> Um, pick two platforms and I'd, ideally I'd want one of them to be Twitter mm-hmm. um, and make sure you're putting your content out on both so that you are um, so that you're putting your content out in a place for example TikTok where you, young people are but also make sure you're being heard by the old people who are on TikTok people who actually run this country mm-hmm. um, so that you can get that influence out there as well because I need more of you in that space where we can actually because I mean all the big um, named uh, presenters of, t- of these news shows, yeah. they all follow me. So they all see, they all see my stuff. Yeah. And that, so that's the space that you need to be in. Mm, yes, you've given us strategy. You are a fountain of knowledge. Uh, you've given us numbers, you've given us stats, and you've given us a strategy as well to take away and go forth with. So thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, you are somebody who I, you know, I never even thought that this would even happen. This was so serendipitous, this meeting, but I'm so thankful. And, you know, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of anybody who is listening that, you know, you've given certainly me, but hopefully others a feeling of hope that we can do something and contribute to the conversation to make some kind of change going forward. Happy to. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon.
I'll see you soon. <laughs> Have a good... Re well, I, well, I can stop this now. Huh, stop! <laughs> <laughs>